Christy. We need to be reminded of that, don't we? God is forever faithful. He is forever good. He is forever watching out for us. Even when we get to mully grubs and think nobody cares and we're about to walk on our lower lip, God's right there with us. He loves us and He cares for us. It is good to be with you again. We're continuing our series on beautiful attitudes, the teachings of Jesus Christ, and we're in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 40 today. I do trust you have your word and you'll follow along with me. You have heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In reading these scriptures and studying this Sermon on the Mount and thinking about it, it's always important to know the audience, really to whom it's addressed, because that affects what's being said, and it gives us understanding. And if you'll remember from your scripture, when Jesus came, he said that he came to the lost tribe, to the tribe of Israel, to those as brothers and sisters. He came as one last push to get them to accept him as the Messiah. That was his primary purpose. Now, of course, that wasn't his only thing. He did preach to the Gentiles. He cared for and healed everyone. But he was really focused on his brothers and sisters and as an Israelite that God had chosen. And one of the more rending passages for me of when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, he was descending down the hill, and he could see Jerusalem before him. And he said, O Israel, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you would come to me, I would, I would shelter you like a hen does its chicks. And he gives us that picture of that mother hen that when there's rain, when there's a storm, will spread her wings and her chicks will come find protection under mama's wings. And Jesus wanted to give his people that kind of loving care and concern. But of course, they rejected him. And so as we read these passages in Matthew, it, it should help to understand that's the focus of what he's saying. All scripture is given for all of us, for reproof, for admonishment, for teaching. And we can glean and learn from all of it. But his comments at the time were focused towards the Israelites. I made that introduction to say, that what Jesus is referring here to here is some law that was given back in the Pentateuch in those first five books in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And the people of Israel would have known these laws. They would have understood where Jesus was coming from. And what we had happening back with the Israelites and and what was happening was something bigger than they were even aware. When God rescued them out of Egypt, when he sent Moses to deliver them from the oppression of Pharaoh and the Egyptians and lead them to a promised land, he was doing more than just blessing them, just doing them a favor. He was doing more than keeping his promise to Abraham. God had intended for his Israelites to be his people who would learn his decrees and his commands 
and live them. And so in that living them, be an example to the people around them of a gracious, loving, powerful, mighty God. They were to exemplify their worship and honor of him through their lives, and they were to testify about him, about the great God. Unfortunately, what they tended to do was consider him just their God. They had a very nationalistic view of God, the people of those days did. In other words, they would think, well, the Israelites have a God they call Jehovah, and the Ammonites would have a God they, they might call Ahasuerus or, or Bazil or Baal or some of those. So each little nation had a God over them, and that's the way they saw the gods. But of course, our God is not. Our God is the creator, the supreme creator of the universe. He made all things. He rules over all things. And that's the message through their lives and through their words that the Israelites were supposed to take to the world. Well, as they're becoming a nation and they're wandering there in the desert and, and then after they entered Canaan, God and his greater purpose and what he was seeing on out there, they thought they were just supposed to live their lives, get in the land, raise their families and, and take care of each other. But God had a deeper plan a longer plan, and that plan was this knowledge of him to all the nations. So God gives them laws. We know the Ten Commandments. We may not have them memorized, but we're familiar with them. We know what they say. We know they are there. But God gave so many more instructions to the people. He gave them dietary instructions of what foods to eat, what foods not to eat, and these were, again, all designed to help the Israelites be a strong, healthy people. He gave them instructions about hygiene, uh, how far away to, to uh, build their waste pits that the humans would have to have and always have had. He gave them those kind of instructions. So God gave them laws to live by. He gave them instructions of how to be healthy, how to be clean, and all of this would make them a stronger people because there would be less disease, not because they are necessarily better people, but because they are people that followed the instructions of God. And so as it is with humans, we tend to do things to each other. We treat each other badly. We take what in is ours. We may lie about another person. So this was going on among the Israelites and they naturally wanted to seek vengeance. And their vengeance would be just all overwhelming, overpowering. And like they typically thought, when they went against their enemy that they foresaw, might be a neighbor they're unhappy with, that they wanted to seek vengeance, they would take everything. If they won the fight, they'd take everything that they wanted of that person's and leave them destitute, if not dead. Well, God knew that wasn't justice. And so he established these rules, these laws that he gave them, where it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And what that meant was that you have equal re re um, repayment, that you only took back what that person took from you. You didn't take everything. You didn't decimate their home. And so it was a means for the people to live justly before each other. And this rule has passed down through the ages as part of our laws today in the ways that we protect ourselves, that we can only use uh, a, a equal and balancing force. We, can, uh, we are not do everything if we want to uh, go after somebody. It, we have retrib retribution of receiving back what was taken to us, that that is a fair and equitable setup. And that's what was taught in the Old Testament. But as we are so wont to do, the people corrupted that. They swayed it to their thinking, and they were taking the words of Jesus to mean that vengeance was their right. 
and that they could take whatever. That, so they had completely turned it on its ear uh, in exercising this. So Jesus, once again, is taking Old Testament thought and he's expanding it, trying to teach them the true meaning of that thought. And so Jesus is, is, is teaching this in this first part of 38 counter to what the people thought. He says, don't resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And so we read those verses and that, that's, that's hard to think about. When someone's done us wrong, we like to give gifts to people we love, to our family members, to those around us who have been special. But to think about giving extra to those people who have wronged us, who treat us badly, who are not respectful of us, is, it goes against our grain. But that's what Jesus is saying here. I wish I could go by John Wayne. John Wayne has a movie. I forget which one it is. And he's facing this bad guy, and the bad guy hauls off and slugs him. John Wayne says, you know, friend, the good book says if someone smites you in the cheek to turn the other cheek. So he stands there, the guy hauls off and belts him on the other cheek. Then John Wayne says, but it don't say what to do after that. And he knocks him out. I've, I've always liked that. I don't think it's really scriptural. But I kind of like John Wayne's thinking there. I turned the other cheek, but after that, it, God doesn't say what to do. But the people were taking advantage of this situation, and Jesus is trying to teach them to, to be more conciliatory, to be forgiving, and, and sometimes in that case, to go on and give them more. This is lined out for us in Deuteronomy chapter 19 verses 15 through 17. Read along this as we display it here on the screen. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a malicious witness takes a stand to accuse someone of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priest and the judges who were in office at the time. And so Jesus is, is giving this principle that it can't just be one person brings an accusation and that's done and they get everything. It's understood that that person could be lying or that person may just be mistaken about what they perceived, and it would become one person's word against the other. And so God outlines this procedure here that there must be other witnesses in order to testify to what really happened, and it's to go before the judges, the leaders of their day, uh, the council, for them to examine the, the testimony the evidence and determine who is right or wrong. And again, this is a, a, some of the precursor, the establishment of our justice system today. We have in our Constitution that a person has the right to face their accuser. You cannot be just charged and that person doesn't have to come, uh, come and stand for what they said. Unfortunately, we do know there's rumor and innuendo and that can be as damaging or more damaging as an actual court case. But this is talking about the need when there is this conflict to go before a judge and to have other people hear the testimony and to determine who's right and who's wrong. Jesus also addressed this in Matthew chapter 18 where he goes in very specific fashion, tells what to do if there is a conflict among some. And it, it, it goes to that very same pattern, really. It says, if you have all against your brother or them against you, go to them first and try to resolve it. Try to talk it out. If they do not listen, then take two or three with you. 
And the idea here is that when you go to two or three people and say, I want you to go confront John with me, and that you're going to, they're going to say, well, why? What's going on? What's happened? And as you tell what's happening, hopefully, if you're in the wrong, they will see that and they can counsel you that you're mistaken, that you're, you're the one who uh, needs to back off. So it's getting that counsel, that extra counsel, and it says you take them and go talk to the person. And then it says in chapter 18, if they still refuse to listen, talking about uh, conflict between uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, to then take it to the church, a bigger body to consider who's right and who's wrong. So Jesus continues this teaching uh, in Matthew 18 of needing to substantiate the evidence in order to be just. And so that's what Jesus is calling to the people here is that it isn't right to just go out on your own, seek vengeance, do what you want to do to get your own back, but there is a process to go through to make sure that it's right and equitable and so forth. And so Jesus then couples this with the next hard teaching there where he starts in verse 43 where he says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies. Now, as I read that, as I'm studying, I'm remembering that there are the different forms of Greek for love. There's eros, which is the uh, physical, lustful kind of love. I I didn't figure it was going to be that one. But then there's phileo. There's the love, brotherly love, where we get the name for Philadelphia from, the city of brotherly love. So I thought maybe that's what Jesus was talking about here. But as I went and confirmed in my concordance, the Greek is actually agape. That highest love that God shows to us, that self-sacrificing love, giving all for the other person. That's the love that Jesus uses in this passage. So he really sets a high bar. It would be one thing if I'm just supposed to have a a brotherly type friendship with my enemy and get along. I, I might could stomach that. I might could deal that. But to love them as Christ loved the church, as Christ loved me, as Christ loved you, that's asking an awful lot, Jesus. But that is what he says here. On the heels of these verses about seeking vengeance to better yourself and 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 make yourself wealthy and rich and and get it over the other person, Jesus then turns around and adds to that and says, love your enemy. Love your enemy with that self-sacrificing love that God shows. And that is what he's done for us. Agape love is that it takes action. It's that compassion that I was talking about. It's easy to give lip service to love. And to say, you know, I love you, and it not mean anything. But love that expresses itself through sacrifice, through giving, that is agape love. That is what Jesus, Jesus who laid down his life for us. And Jesus taught us, greater love has no man than this, that one would lay down his life for another. And we are told that perhaps somebody may give their life for a good man. We have many people who have served in our military over the years who in danger came, sacrificed their life so that their co-brothers in battle would live. We have the stories, the heroic stories of people falling on a grenade so that the shrapnel would be stopped by their body and save the lives. We, we know there are these heroic acts where we would do things for other people that are good and that we'd like to see live. But it, the first goes on and says, but who would die for an evil man? But that's what God calls us to, to have that kind of a love that we would, we would even give what we need to for those that we don't like those we hate, those we just just don't want to be around. And God calls us to that agape love. 
Those are hard teachings. These are hard teachings that Jesus gives us. In John 6.66, it's kind of one of my favorite verses for a different reason. But Jesus is teaching his disciples, all his followers, not just the 12 we think of, but everyone following him was a disciple. He's teaching them, and he comes up on, some, on a teaching, and they say, this is hard. Who can believe this? And they followed him no more. The teachings of Jesus, yes, he teaches us, he says, love one another, but that's not just a gushy uh, uh, type of love that, that patronizes people. It's a love that costs. And it is difficult to do these things that Jesus has called us to, but he gives us what we need. The reason that verse, uh, I, I, I claimed it and liked it, is because it took some pressure off of me as a pastor, to be honest with you. Because I started realizing if Jesus, the Son of God, could not convince everybody to believe and follow him, then I'm sure not. So that... Uh, it just took some of that onus off. And my, my role is to preach the Word of God and the Holy Spirit works in our lives to convict and to draw us. And that's what we are, are, are supposed to do. We sometimes, this is a side message, we sometimes try to be the Holy Spirit for other people about what they should do, what, how they should correct and clean themselves up. And we need to let the Holy Spirit work in their lives as He knows they need. Now back to our message today. These are hard things that Jesus taught us to do. And that agape love is that benefit to the others. I remember when I was a child, I bet you heard it, that this hurts me more than it hurts you as I took the paddle or the belt and laid it to me. And as my little bottom stung, it was hard to realize. It was kind of, mm, not sure I believe what you're saying there, mom or dad. But now as I become an adult, and I've had to discipline my children, whether it's through a spanking or just other type of discipline, I realize what they're saying. It hurts as a parent to have to restrict, to have to discipline your child. You want to just have good times. You want to just be all laughing and playing, but sometimes they're not stupid, but they do stupid things, and they need correction. They may have some of our stubbornness, but they need to be encouraged not to follow that and do their homework, clean themselves up, do their task, and we have to, sometimes we have to get stern and make them do that. We don't do it to be mean, and we'd rather not. But we know they need to learn how to keep themselves clean, how to take care of their bodies, how to do the task given them, because that will make them an independent and strong adult later who can face the challenges of life. And so we set aside some of that fun time in order to make them do things because they need it later on, even though they don't understand. Hebrews 12, 5 and 11 talks about discipline, and this applies to all of us. And it says, And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, as his son? And it says, My son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? And if you are not disciplined, and everybody undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, you are not true sons and daughters." Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant. That's the truth. That's 
truest part of Scripture almost, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You know, I, in my teaching in the Bible and in, in churches started a long time ago before I became a pastor doing Sunday school and other things. Children act up. And I've come to learn sometimes, and I've read it elsewhere, sometimes they're acting out is trying to get somebody to pay attention to them. If they're good, it's just like they're not seen, they're not known. But if they act out, they get attention. Now that attention may be a whipping, it may be some kind of form of punishment, but at least they know that someone knows they're there and cares enough about them to do something. And very often, if those children can receive the right kind of love and, and upbringing, then they, they won't need to act out. Some don't have that at all in their homes. Not long this, this past week, I was listening to the radio and it was talking about the dearth of two parent families and the difference between now and many years ago when most every child had two parents in the home. Larry Elder and others, uh, Denzel Washington are two important names, will talk about the need for fathers in the, in the homes of, of their people. We, that discipline is love. And it shows that we care. We believe enough in a person in order to help them become better, to become stronger. And when we hold back on that discipline, we shortchange them. And God treats us like sons, and He disciplines us. And it isn't pleasant at the time, but it does make us stronger to bear the challenges we have in life to be able to stand up to those. There are things that all of you as adults I know face, have faced in your life that you can look back and you can think, I don't know how I ever did it. I don't know how I, I managed to stand up onto that. But you did through God's strength, through support of friends and family, and you're stronger. And now you have bigger challenges than you did then. That's that discipline. That's that endurance that we're called for to see it as a discipline to strengthen us. If we want to be on some sports team, we've got to have the discipline to do the exercises, to build up our muscles, to get our timing. That all is discipline. And God calls us to that discipline. And that discipline includes loving others, being compassionate seeing a need and trying to find a way to help that need, whether it's just telling them, I say just, I shouldn't diminuize it, diminish it like that, but tell them about Jesus Christ. It may be all the power we have is to pray for them. But when someone is irritating you, annoying you, and, and uh, you, you'd like to really go out and stick a knife in their tire, pray for them. You can, you can do that. Maybe they won't accept help from you. Maybe they won't let you pray for them. But you can talk to your father. And as we develop compassion, and as we develop some wisdom, and as we look at our life, we'll start realizing that something is driving that behavior. There's a reason that they're that way. And if we can have some understanding, it can help us to pray for them and to offer assistance and to help them. And so Jesus is calling us to all of this, to not seek vengeance. I don't have to seek that for myself because I have a Heavenly Father who loves me, who sees me, who knows what I need, and who wants to provide what I need. So I can give my cloak because I know He's going to provide for me. I can do without a meal because I know He's going to provide more food. We have a Father that's taking care of us and we trust in Him and that enables and empowers us 
to be more giving and more helpful to others. And God rewards that. He sees that. That's what He calls us to. These teachings of Jesus are hard. They're demanding. They stretch us beyond what seems reasonable. So we have that choice. Do we believe we have a Father that loves us, that will take care of us, who sees our needs and wants to provide that? Or will we continually thinking, I've got to do it. It's only up to me. We have to do the work He calls us to, whether that's going to our 9 to 5 Monday through Friday or 9 to 9, whatever your hours are. That's part of it. But even in all that, trusting He's supplying our needs. And so that's where Jesus leaves us today. Instead of seeking for ourselves, seek for others, love them as the Father loved us, and trust Him to watch over us. Let's stand as we go into our hymn of invitation. As we sing, if you need to, be silent and meditate on God for a little bit. And as you've heard these words, you can ask Him, Father, illuminate in my life what you need me to yield to you. Illuminate my life what I'm holding on to too tightly. Help me to release it. Illuminate in me your word, Lord, that I may grow. Let's sing. Mm-hmm.